Okay. So I'm going to first uh, just kind of give you a, a survey of the situation as I see it. Basically, um, as um, Will was just reading, I mean, we are in a desperate situation, if you believe climate science, uh, and we need to believe climate science. So uh, the most recent comprehensive study of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change came out in August 2021. The IPCC is a um, unit of the United Nations uh, that does not conduct research on its own, but basically gathers research uh, <coughs> from climate scientists, uh, thousands really. So it's uh, basically what they put out a report. It's a kind of conservative consensus perspective of the various people um, whose work they're summarizing. So they came out with their most recent one in August, uh, this past August, that was um, supportive of one that they came out with three years ago in October, 2018. And that was the first uh, document coming out of the IPCC that insisted that <clears throat> we needed to think about stabilizing the global average temperature at 1.5 degrees Celsius above the pre-industrial level, as opposed to what they had been saying, two degrees Celsius. It doesn't seem like a big difference, but according to their research and according to what we are observing, uh, the uh, impacts of uh, global warming uh, get uh, intense, intensifying at disproportionate nonlinear rates as we move from 1.5 to 2 and as we're already moving. Uh, what we are observing, as we all know, uh, we're seeing heat extremes, we're seeing floods, we're seeing droughts, we're seeing biodiversity losses. Uh, these are causing uh, all kinds of phenomena that we hadn't seen before, like the fires last summer all throughout California, intense fires in Australia. Uh, two years ago, we had the hurricanes, double hurricane in Puerto Rico that wiped out about 10% of the economy in a matter of days. Uh, these things are gonna keep happening at increasing rates. Uh, the, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC, also does set out some, uh, a pathway towards climate stabilization. And it's, you know, the most recent report, this August 2021 report, uh, is, um, is almost 4,000 pages long. Uh, so there's a lot of details that I'm not going to go over. And of course, I haven't read all 4,000 pages. But the most basic finding, which has framed the debates on climate change uh, throughout the world since uh, October 2018, is that we need to cut carbon dioxide emissions by 50% as of 2030, which is only eight years from now, uh, basically. And we have to be at zero emissions uh, by 2050. Now here's uh, what we're looking at in terms of the trajectory of uh, global temperatures. And what we're seeing here the, from 1870 to 2020, um, this uh, zero represents the uh, average temperature of the pre-industrial era. So let's say 1850 and before, okay. And so really, Though uh, scientists have known about the phenomenon of climate change for a while, we really haven't had any uh, serious impacts occurring. This is all the way up to 1940. The average global temperature was below, below the pre-industrial level by up to one half of one degree. Uh, we have this kind of interregnum period where we do have a spike during World War II. Uh, then falls below, rises, but the real uh, persistent increase 
and the average global temperature, as you can see, starts around 1980 and continues to the present. And we are at a point now where we are at 1.1 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. And if we believe the IPCC, we need to stabilize at 1.5 degrees. So we don't have a whole lot of room or a whole lot of time to stabilize. Okay, uh, here is some rather sobering things. This is pre-COP26. Uh, I'll talk about that in a second. Um, what we're looking at in this table are the actual level of uh, CO2 emissions uh, as of 2019 and the projections of the International Energy Agency, IEA, which is the premier organization which studies the uh, global energy infrastructure. Okay, so what they call the stated policies um, are basically the policies that countries agreed to at the last big climate summit in Paris in 2015. Um, so right now we are at uh, 36 billion tons per year of new emissions coming into the atmosphere. If we follow the uh, things that governments agreed to do and maybe have, haven't done entirely, but things they agreed to do, uh, here's what the International Energy Agency says is gonna happen with, with emissions. Well, by 2030, emissions will actually go up from 36 to 36.3 billion tons. And by 2050, we're at basically 34 billion tons. So if the world proceeds more or less according to the uh, patterns that we have observed since Paris in 2015, effectively, I mean, the result is we're doomed. Uh, that's why I say we're courting ecological disaster. We do not see any significant movement downward in emissions. Now, second uh, scenario that they consider is if the countries agreed, uh, did everything that they agreed to, as opposed to just doing, well, let's do some of the things we agreed to when we feel like it. That's what they call the announced pledges. Even according to those announced pledges as of the Paris Agreement, by 2030, we would still be at 34 billion tons, almost no reduction whatsoever. And by 2050, when the, uh, the IPCC says we have to be at zero emissions, we're still at 21 billion emissions. And you can see, let's just take the net zero trajectory by the International Energy Agency, 36 billion now, 21 billion by 2030, and zero by 2050. The, uh, the International Energy Agency is saying, we can get to zero uh, when we can cut emissions roughly in half by 2030, but we have to be really committed to doing it. We can't just have a lot of speeches. And as you can see, the speeches and the pledges that came out of Paris 2015 accomplished, will accomplish, has accomplished almost nothing. Okay, we just finished the COP26 conference yesterday. So this was the follow-up to the Paris, the 2015 Paris Agreement. And what happened there, and I'm just gonna quote you from two uh, stories in the uh, press just today, from one from the Financial Times. Um, another, the Financial Times summary is, as you can see, uh, the delegates from the nearly 200 countries gathered in Glasgow uh, are leaving with the same grim mathematical problem they had when they arrived. All their climate plans and pledges do not yet add up to enough to meet the goals of the 2015 Paris Agreement, which aims to keep global warming well below two degrees Celsius from what it was in pre-industrial times and preferably to a safer limit of 1.5 degrees Celsius. So the Financial Times says, 
grim mathematical problem not solved. Okay, yet the financial, uh, the New York Times has a somewhat more positive spin, a major agreement to intensify efforts to, flight, to fight climate change by calling on governments to return next year. So the major accomplishment of the agreement, uh, the two week conference that was discussed for a couple of years, the major accomplishment as of last night was to come back next year with stronger plans to curb global warming and to get the wealthy nations to uh, help finance the poor countries from the hazards of a hotter climate. So uh, the rhetoric has gotten more uh, focused. The level of commitment and rhetoric is stronger, but in terms of actual accomplishments, actual pledges having come out of this conference that just ended yesterday, we have basically nothing. And as you can see, this summarizes it, the pledges coming out of the conference as of yesterday uh, versus where we need to do be, as you can see, it says policies and actions uh, committed uh, as of November, 2021, the conference, we would end up at two and a half to 2.9 degrees Celsius uh, global warming increase, as opposed to where we need to be way down here at 1.5 degrees. Okay, that's where we are as of today. So what do we do about it? Okay, I'm gonna propose some very simple things. They're very simple in terms of the analytics, the economics, the financing, <laughs> even the technology, but they're very, very difficult politically, as we can see. So let me do the simple stuff first, show what we really need. So the first thing that we need to do is we need to stop burning fossil fuels to produce energy. That's basically it. We have to accomplish that. And if we accomplish that, we will not solve the problem of climate change, <clears throat> but we will have gone very far to solve the problem. So we need to stop burning fossil fuels to produce energy because it's responsible for about 70% of all the emissions that are causing climate change. Now, if we were to start cutting now to get to zero by 2050, it does not come out as being that daunting. That is, we only need to make cuts of less than 4% per year relative to the absolute levels of consumption that we have right now. So 3.5%, 3.5% every year, and that is feasible. Now, burning fossil fuels is the major source of energy throughout the world, oil, coal, and natural gas. So the second part is if we are gonna start cutting fossil fuels every year uh, by three and a half percent, then we have to come up with a substitute. And the substitute needs to be um, sources of energy that do not generate uh, CO2 emissions that are clean and that enable us to eliminate the sources of climate change. So the first thing that we need to think about is to raise energy efficiency standards dramatically. The evidence, the engineering research shows us that we can uh, increase our use of our use of machines. Basically, we use energy to run machines, all kinds of machines. We can cut the use of energy for machines by upwards of 50%. And that means in everything, in the buildings, in transportation systems, and industrial production. And then once we have a dramatically more efficient uh, energy infrastructure, we fill in the remaining demand for energy 
with clean renewable energy sources, primarily solar power, wind power, but also geothermal, some small scale hydro and some bioenergy. Now I've been modeling this for some time and my own estimate is that to do this substitution, to contract fossil fuels down to zero in the next 28 years and to uh, replace it with high efficiency and renewable is going to cost about two and a half percent of total global economic activity, what we call GDP, two and a half percent per year. Now that's a lot of money because we have an $80 trillion global economy. It would mean about $2.2 trillion this year and an average between now and 2050 at about 4.5 trillion per year. Uh, this is my own results from my own model, but it actually within the last year, uh, several other models have been published and they come out roughly the same over and over and over again. Different agencies uh, like the International Energy Agency, the United Nations, some private companies like uh, Deloitte, Bank of America, some governmental agencies, uh, they're converging on the same number. So it's probably a pretty good estimate of what we're talking about. And it's also the case that we're not at zero in terms of these investments in energy efficiency and renewables. We're at about a half a percentage point. So that we need to ramp up from a half a percentage point to two and a half percentage points or thereabouts. So we're talking about a lot of money, but we're also think of it this way, 97% of all economic activity does not have to be in this energy, clean energy transformation. We can still operate much of the economy doing the things that it's doing uh, or changing it, but for changing it for other reasons. Uh, we don't have to mobilize at the level of World War II to uh, achieve a climate, sustainable climate path. Um, so that's the first thing. And the second thing we need to do is to transform our global agricultural system. Uh, Will and Tyler were talking about uh, our use of land uh, in our region. Uh, and in fact, the main way through which we produce food uh, in the in the world increasingly is through corporate industrial agricultural practices, which are generating about 30%, the other 30% of all greenhouse gas emissions. About half of that comes from deforestation. Trees absorb carbon dioxide. When they're chopped down, they release carbon dioxide. So uh, the deforestation of the Amazon rainforest is a major factor contributing to climate change because of the deforestation. And so that for the first time last year, the uh, Amazon rainforest has released more carbon dioxide than it has absorbed through uh, the trees, through the trees that are uh, standing in, in the Amazon. Uh, other areas of agricultural transformation, uh, yes, cattle do uh, release methane gas, which is a highly intensive uh, greenhouse gas. It's not as prevalent as carbon dioxide, but it, uh, it has a highly toxic impact. And so the, uh, the consumption of uh, cattle products, uh, uh, dairy products and meat are contributing to uh, climate change, both by having a population of a few billion cattle in the world, but also because they take up a lot of land and the land that's needed for cattle farming is being uh, supplied by deforestation of uh, the Amazon and other critical areas of the world. So uh, that, that's why we need to think about a two-tier project, transition out of, uh, out of fossil fuel energy into clean energy and transition out of corporate 
agriculture into uh, uh, reforestation and organic uh, agricultural practices, which will absorb uh, carbon dioxide. Now, the discussion that uh, has went on at the conference, the COP conference, uh, was about funding levels. So I gave you the rough number, which is about two and a half percent of global economic activity, global GDP. And if we just look at the main uh, rich countries, the European Union and the US, okay, what they're talking about, the European Union is in terms of rhetoric has been most committed by rhetoric in terms of advancing a climate stabilization project, but the budget that they have talked about to, through 2030 is a trillion euros. Now, a trillion euros, that sounds like a huge amount of money, and it is at one level, but we have to scale these things. A trillion over a decade is about 100 billion a year, and that is about 0.7% of the European Union's budget. It's not two and a half percent of the European Union's budget. And, and frankly, the European Union budget has to have the two and a half percent for its own uh, region and also to support low income countries in their transition as they have committed to do. So they have not committed anything close to what's necessary. Now, Biden, we, we've heard about the Build Back Better program, social infrastructure, climate, at this point, we don't know if anything is going to pass, but as of the most recent discussions, the share of funding going into climate stabilization is about $50 billion a year, if it passes. And that is only about equal to 0.2% of GDP. So it is nowhere close to what we need. Yes, we can have other sources of funding. It doesn't all have to be the federal government. But if we're starting at such a low level at the federal government, it's gonna be difficult to make it up through states, through the municipalities and through private investment. Okay, that said, the Global Green New Deal, which as I said, is the program effectively to advance investments in clean energy to transform our energy system and, and, to transform our agricultural system. Uh, it is not just a climate stabilization program narrowly conceived. It is a climate stabilization program that, as I say here, is fully compatible with raising living standards and uh, expanding uh, opportunity. Why? Why will it do that? Well, because it's an investment program. When, when you invest in anything, you create jobs and you'll create a lot of jobs through investing in the uh, building up the clean energy infrastructure and transitioning our agricultural system. It will create a lot of jobs. I mean, I've done estimates for a lot of countries. I've done estimates for the United States. Actually, right now I'm doing estimates for South Korea. Uh, I've done them in Europe. We're looking at, if we want to add it up throughout the world, we're looking at something like 150 million jobs. In this country, we're looking at something like 4 million jobs. It doesn't mean that they're going to be good jobs. They can be bad jobs, but creating the jobs creates the opportunity for people to organize, to unionize, to create standards, uh, high wage standards. Without the investments, we don't have that opportunity. So the Green New Deal taking, you know, yes, it's invoking the name of the New Deal, which was the program out of FDR in the 1930s, Roosevelt administration to get out of the Great Depression uh, in a way that also expands opportunity, ex expands equality in the US. And this is a Green New Deal which is going to combine those egalitarian features with environmental sustainability. So it will create jobs. It's going to deliver, this is critical, 
lower cost electricity. Building up the clean energy infrastructure is gonna deliver cheaper energy. Even if you don't care about the environment, we already know that renewable energy is at cost parity or cheaper than fossil fuels. On top of that, by investing in energy efficiency, we need less energy by definition to keep buildings warm, lit, to move from point A to point B, either through public transportation or private transportation, and to run machinery. So it's going to be cheaper. We have to build the infrastructure, but once we build it, it's gonna be cheaper. And this is particularly valuable. Of course, it's across the board. But when we think about in most rural communities and low income countries, about half of the people have no access to electricity, none. Uh, so this is going to be transformative by creating an opportunity for electricity to come to these communities. It will also create opportunities for alternative ownership forms. We already have in the US, in the Great Plains states, uh, about 40% of all the uh, electricity is already being generated by mostly wind power uh, through cooperative ownership forms, alternative ownership forms, community ownership, and it's generating more income for farmers because they put uh, wind turbines on their agricultural land and it gives them an additional source of income. The Green New Deal will also improve public health by reducing pollution. That will happen when we stop burning fossil fuels, it will clear the air. So that's the package. That's what I think we need and it is able to generate this range of benefits. At the same time, we have to think about the fact that we are going to be eliminating fossil fuels that means we are going to be eliminating the jobs for the fossil fuel workers. That will have major impacts, not only on the workers, but on their communities. So another component of the Green New Deal has to be what we call a just transition. And the just transition has to mean that the workers whose jobs are vulnerable are going to get their pensions guaranteed. They're gonna get jobs at equal pay they're gonna be guaranteed jobs at equal pay. And part of the way that that becomes feasible is the fact that we are expanding jobs in the green energy economy. We need retraining and relocation support for workers as needed. Uh, I've costed this out for the US uh, and our, my estimate is it would cost to do a robust, fair, uh, generous, uh, just transition program for workers would be about $2 billion per year. Again, that sounds like a big, big, big number, but when you compare it relative to overall activity, GDP and the economy, it's less than one one hundredth of 1%. We also have to be focused on the communities. And so we think about, let's say West Virginia. I did a study for West Virginia. We need to reclaim the land. We need to be focused. And that also is part of the, that will create jobs, reclaiming the land, repurposing the land. Uh, one, one region of the world that has been pretty successful in this is in Germany, uh, the Ruhr Valley, which was kind of the equivalent of West Virginia, heavy coal area. And they've been putting in solar and hydropower installations in the former coal mines. And so in my view, when we say climate stabilization program or Green New Deal, it isn't just to get emissions down to zero, which it must be, of course, but it's also doing it in a way that is creating opportunities broadly uh, and that is uh, focused on providing just transition for workers and communities who will be negatively impacted and there will be those people and communities. Okay, to the question of Will and Tyler, is capitalism at the root cause of the climate crisis? Absolutely yes. 
uh, but let me be more specific when I say absolutely yes. Uh, first of all, when we look at the emergence of the industrial era, say in around 1830, 1840, fossil fuel energy was critical to the entire project. Without the fossil fuel industry, we might have had an industrial revolution, but it would have looked a lot different. And one of the ways that it would have looked a lot different, the, the, the ability to use coal as a source of energy to run machinery enabled businesses to locate basically wherever they wanted to locate. Prior to having the coal power, the business to, in order to run uh, machinery for industry, they had to rely on water power. So they had to locate near where they could run uh, water power, water mills, and that limited the capacity of businesses to locate. The fact that businesses could locate any place gave them more bargaining power over workers because rather than saying, oh, we're going to be uh, in this water mill and we're going to create a dam to generate the uh, power that we need to run machinery. And therefore we need to attract workers to where the water power is. They could locate wherever they wanted and that gave them more power because they didn't have to fight to attract workers to where the water mills were. So that's kind of a very brief, broad historical perspective. Then in terms of jumping all the way to the present, there's no question uh, we saw the demonstration at the COP26 conference that ended yesterday. There's no question that the biggest obstacle to uh, advancing a climate stabilization program is the profits that are received uh, by burning fossil fuels. Burning oil, coal, and natural gas is a gigantic industry. If we were to stop burning it, the estimates are that they would lose about $15 trillion of asset value. So that is at the core of the problem. However, now let me complicate the story. 90% of global fossil fuel assets are already publicly owned, okay? Yes, uh, ExxonMobil, Chevron, British Petroleum and so forth, Shell, these are private capitalist companies and they have a massive stake in sustaining the fossil fuel era, but they're not the only ones. Okay, let's be really clear about that. 90% of global fossil fuel assets are publicly owned by public corporations. <coughs> yes, throughout, <coughs> throughout the Middle East, Saudi, Saudi Arabia, but not only Russia, not only Russia, in uh, Brazil, in Venezuela. I mean, how do we think uh, in Venezuela that they were able to sustain some pretty good uh, redistribution programs to support the poor? And in Ecuador, same thing. That was through oil revenues. So if we want to say that capitalism is the root cause, private ownership is the root cause and public ownership is therefore the solution to the climate crisis. Hey, we've already kind of 90% there to the solution. Obviously public ownership in and of itself is not the solution to the climate crisis. Burning fossil fuels and stopping burning fossil fuels is the solution, is the most important solution, but ownership, public ownership all by itself is not the solution. Okay, now we have, uh, uh, Will and Tyler discussed briefly eco-socialism. Let me just say something about that. What do we mean by eco-socialism as opposed to, is it distinct from what I'm calling the Global Green New Deal or are we just basically parsing terminology? And obviously none of us just wanna argue about words. We want to do things that actually matter. And my, here's my view of it. What I call the Green New Deal 
I could call it eco-socialism. What the Green New Deal, in my view, is able to accomplish is the, are the things that you see. It is a means through getting to zero by eliminating burning fossil fuels, eliminating corporate agriculture, substituting clean energy and uh, regenerative agriculture, reforestation. That's number one. Number two, as I said, it is a means through which we expand job opportunities. It is an anti-austerity program. In fact, when I did research and devised programs in uh, Spain, Greece, Puerto Rico, they were anti-austerity programs. They weren't just about climate. They were also about fighting austerity, expanding job opportunities. And those things will also raise living standards to the extent that we have expanding jobs and they're decent jobs. As I said, it also will create opportunities for alternative ownership forms, for cooperatives, small scale. In particular, in rural areas, this is very important. And the Green New Deal includes a just transition. Now, what is eco-socialism? What do we mean by it beyond what I'm talking about? And the answer is, I honestly, without being rhetorical, I honestly don't know. Now, we could say that we want to eliminate private ownership of the, of the uh, energy industry, or more generally. Um, well, we already saw that public ownership is dominant. Okay, so that is not a solution. If we want to say we want to transition out of capitalism altogether, uh, that's a good point of consideration, but we're not going to get there in 10 years by 2030. We're not going to get there in 30 years. Uh, we can fight to get there step by step and learn and improve our understanding of what constitutes uh, socialism. But in the time scale that we have to actually get to zero emissions, there's no way, in my opinion, there's no way we can seriously think about the end of capitalism. And so that therefore the Green New Deal approach, which encompasses uh, the features of, that I would say are critical for a socialist vision. It's, it's a climate stabilization program. It's a, uh, a sustainability program. It's an egalitarian program. It's a program on behalf of workers and communities to me, that's the program that is viable for now and for the present. And so I'll end there in saying, again, the Green New Deal, a global Green New Deal, is a program that can work now, that we can fight for, and let's get there. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Bob. Um, we'll open it up for questions now. If anyone has a question, they can come on up, address the, address the screen. Can you ask a question from the, uh, <laughs> yeah, before standing up or what would it? Yeah, right. you do not have to go up to ask a question. If you just raise your voice so that everyone can hear. Yeah, you can hear me. Uh, no, I can hear fine. Okay, good. Um, it seems that getting rid of capitalism, it, so you would feel that a government would be able to run things more efficiently than uh, in a private corporation, and I don't always see that evidence in uh, real life. Uh, yeah, so I mean, my view, and I call myself a socialist. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what that means, and I'm not sure anybody exactly knows what that means. And if we want to go all the way back to Lenin, uh, the leader of the Soviet Revolution, in 1919, Lenin described uh, communism as consisting of Soviets, and that was the you know their groups. He said, it's Soviets plus electrification. 
So in his view, expanding the energy infrastructure was an absolutely critical part of expanding people's life opportunities. And that remains the case for much of the world's population. Now, oh, am I totally convinced that uh, public ownership is going to achieve uh, a higher level of efficiency, much less being uh, less committed to making money off of burning fossil fuels than private companies? Well, we, we already know, we already have the evidence. As I said, 90% of the fossil fuels that are being burnt now are owned by public companies. And we can say, oh, well, you know, they're not really good ones. Uh, you know, they're bad people. They're in Saudi Arabia, they're in Russia. Uh, but we could then also say, well, wait, uh, you know, in, in uh, Venezuela, there was, you know, they were a socialist government uh, and they were burning fossil fuels and you know, you could say, well, they're, they're burning fossil fuels and yes, they were distributing the revenue uh, equitably. Um, so I don't know that a, you know, large scale public ownership is going to accomplish in and of itself much of anything. Uh, it, it could, I, it's, I'll leave that as an open question. As I said, what I see actually, to me, more interesting evidence are the emergence of uh, small scale enterprises, public and private community ownership, such as in um, South Dakota, North Dakota, Great Plains states, where the communities are setting up mostly wind farms. Uh, they have a lot of wind and um, they're getting their electricity from that wind and they're making money off of it because they're cutting back on their having to buy fossil fuel energy because they're they're generating their own electricity and they're selling it in the community. So ownership forms, I, in my opinion, uh, we need to be open-minded about it. Uh, public ownership has uh, shown itself in many places to have some positive benefits, but not entirely, not exclusively. Uh, so I would say to me, again, the Green New Deal starts with stop burning fossil fuels, uh, replace it with clean energy infrastructures, and we can be open-minded about the types of energy ownership forms that take place in this transition. Sure. Can you hear me? Yeah, just fine. I can see you too. Okay. Hi. Um, can you give me an example of one, one example of a socialist system actually working? Because the, you call capitalism, but the free market system is the greatest economic tool that the world has ever seen, where people from all socioeconomic levels have been able to apply it and benefit from it. When you say socialism, I think of Lenin, exactly how many tens of millions of people did he have killed? Um, I think of Jamestown, the first settlement, which failed because it was based on socialism. Um, I would like you to give an example of a socialist system that actually works. Well, okay. Uh, I mean, it's we're getting pretty general, uh, and that, I'm fine with that. So um, I think that you know, to be fair, there is a range of experiences that we can call socialist. Uh, the most prevalent, sustained example at present, I think you can call the uh, Nordic countries. Uh, Sweden, Denmark, Norway, um, social democratic or liberal socialist. Uh, and those countries actually have accomplished a great deal in terms of A, uh, achieving living standards that are comparable on average to let's say the US or elsewhere in Western Europe. But in doing so, 
also creating uh, much higher levels of equality of opportunity, uh, much higher levels of uh, social integration, equality uh, for women, and so forth. So I would say that, you know, and they, they operate with public sector uh, providing, I don't, I don't know, about half of all economic activity runs through the public sector. That still means that half of the activity runs through the private sector. So uh, I think the social democratic the Nordic countries are a good example. And by the way, uh, the Nordic countries have done uh, better, not good enough, but better in terms of reducing emissions. Sweden is really the best single case of a country that experienced a rising economic growth and declining CO2 emissions. Okay, now let's talk about Russia and the Soviet, Russia, Soviet Union, China, and so forth. Uh, yeah, I think it's fair to say that those countries experienced uh, some uh, very bad history. Um, but it isn't entirely a negative picture. It is, there are some very negative features, but uh, if we look at the case of China, China basically lifted people out of destitution under communism. Uh, that was an amazing achievement. The, for example, life expectancy in the years that Mao Zedong for all of his negative uh, interventions, life expectancy went up from about 45 years to about 70 years. And I'd say that that is a tremendous achievement achieved under, under socialism. Now, when we talk about China today, they, they're still run by the Communist Party. It's not democratic, uh, but under, the Chinese version of capitalism led by the Communist Party, they have advanced, you know, 20% of the world's population into, a, uh, into becoming a, a middle income country. So I think, you know, there's lessons to be learned that are negative, yes, lessons that are positive from the experiences of socialism. And in, again, thinking about how we advance today, I don't wanna, I, I myself am not as interested in debating the finer points of what we mean by socialism as I am thinking of a solution to the climate crisis that also will expand well-being. Um, I guess I would take issue with your belief that China has elevated most of its population. Uh, I have a daughter-in-law who is from a very poor area of China. She managed to emigrate to Canada when she was with, when she was a girl. Um, China has sharp demarcations in their socioeconomic groups. They have their working class, the city people, the elites, the academics, and then they have millions of very poor people who are subsistence farmers, which is fine. They're getting along, but they have no real help from the government. And China is a nation that has almost no concern for civil human rights. Um, I would also, I, I think some of what I'm hearing depends on where you get your information. When I first heard about global warming, um, climate change several years ago, I also saw documents from scientists, some 34,000 scientists signed a document stating that they did not believe there was significant global warming going on. United Nations, in my opinion, is a one world government entity um, and I think the 1,000 or the 1% 1 are the elitists who want to control the, the rest of the world. I think they are one world government people. And I'll just give you a sort of a quote from Al Gore, which I heard this week. Um, he recently said that there is a network of satellites which will 
have the capability to spy on every person on earth to see if anyone is doing something that violates the um, Green New Deal or whatever they're going to call it. That is the equivalent of, of uh, when you think of the social credit scores in China, this is invasive and this is uh, human population. It's tyranny. It's a form of tyranny. Also at the CCP 26 in Glasgow, I'm not sure it was Prince Andrew, but somebody well known said that in order to achieve their goals, there cannot be any, any if you have any trees on your property, you cannot cut them and you will be taxed for every tree on your property. Now, I see these globalists not as our friends. I see them as implementing a, a fake narrative of this uh, fossil fuels, uh, what do I say, global, I think their information is not trustworthy because their real agenda is Agenda 21 slash 30. Are you familiar with that agenda? What do you call I, I Agenda 21? No, I'm not familiar with that. It's a soft treaty from the UN. It was signed, I think, in 92 by 170 nations. And it has to do with sustainable development. Well, sustainable development is a subjective term. And this is very weird. But when I heard about sustainable development about 10 years ago, I knew nothing about it. I had never been to the UN website. So I went to the UN website. And this was about 10 years ago. And I clicked on a link that said sustainable development. And the first page, it's not there anymore, but that page had a quote by the late Jacques Cousteau, also a globalist, who said that if they are to achieve their goal of reducing population down to 500 million people, it's currently over 7 million, that a certain number of people would have to die every day. Uh, I saw that. I read it with my own eyes. And I realized that this is pretty serious stuff. And the United Nations is not the benevolent organization that I guess I thought it was. Um, so OK, well, um, you know, uh, I, I haven't seen these sources. I haven't seen a quote from Al Gore. Um, let me just respond in this way. Uh, there are uh, climate science, there are people who don't believe the climate science that I've referred to. And they are about 2% uh, of climate scientists. And so about 98% uh, agree with the rough conclusions that I presented. Um, it doesn't mean that they're right. It could mean it could be that the that the two percent are right and the ninety eight percent are wrong. I'll accept that as a possibility. <coughs> uh, I do believe that the ninety eight percent that are working uh, are serious, sincere people. I know some of them. Uh, I don't believe that they have any kind of nefarious plans in mind. And the fact is that we don't need them to be absolutely right in order to take action um, because we really should think of this is in terms of an insurance policy. If the 98% are right, uh, that means that we really have to totally transform our global energy system and our agricultural system. And in doing so, uh, we will, as I said, we'll deliver lower cost energy, we'll expand job opportunities, um, we will generate cleaner air. So as an insurance policy, it's actually pretty cheap. Uh, and so that I'd say we'd be willing to uh, expand the resources in order to buy insurance against the possibility that the 98% are right. If you told me that, you know, the only way that we can accomplish any kind of climate stabilization path is going to mean that people won't be able to turn on their electricity, 
They won't be able to, to uh, run, drive their cars. We won't be able to operate uh, in, uh, factory machinery. Well, then that would be another matter. But in fact, what I'm saying is that building a clean energy infrastructure is going to be totally viable, affordable, and it is going to expand life opportunities. I'll believe it when I see it. Thank you for your time. There's just a few questions on the uh, computer that we'd also, you will definitely have a chance to ask me questions so long as you stay. I would like to just, um, there's two short questions here. One of them you've already addressed and out of respect for the people who stuck it out online, uh, we'll upload this full thing with the slides afterwards, but we had just the audio going. Um, one is wondering, and they did not respond to my question. If if, they were, if there was any reason for this. Uh, I would like to ask the speaker if he has ever owned or operated a business with employees. So that perhaps is a simple yes or no. Uh, yes. Right. And then the other, and I know you spoke about this quite a lot, but I just want to uh, read it as it appears here. Is there zero potential for this compatibility between public management of fossil fuel resources, especially in the short term? Zero compatibility. Is, is there zero potential for this compatibility between public management of fossil fuel resources? So I think they're probably responding to the statement you made that 90% of... Uh, well, all I'm saying is that it's not a given that public ownership is going to deliver the climate stabilization path. And we don't have to speculate on that. We know because 90% of the fossil fuel assets are already publicly owned. And as I said, we had, I mean, whatever one may think of Hugo Chavez and his years as president of Venezuela, um, he did deliver uh, a lot of social benefits to low income people in Venezuela. And the main way he was able to do that was by selling fossil fuels. That's it. So, uh, you know, he had a public corporation and that he used the revenues for that purpose. And that's a good purpose for the revenues, in my opinion, but it didn't reduce emissions at all. Uh, it, and so when we think about a climate program, meaning eliminating fossil fuel consumption and substituting clean energy, we can't assume that a publicly owned or, or uh, organization is gonna do better than the private. And uh, we therefore need to be, in my opinion, open-minded about the types of uh, assets, who owns the assets, who, what's the best way to get on the climate stabilization path, uh, meaning to zero fossil fuels. I think we need to be open-minded. Thank you. Okay, hi, Bob. Hi. I'm Denise, economics, uh, Smith, class of 94. So, um, so I'm with you on a lot of the things that you have to say. First of all, congratulations on your book last year with Noam Chomsky. And Thank you. Uh, yeah, good for you. I'm, I'm happy for you on that. Listen, I want to ask you a couple of things. So the first one is when we talk about us, I'm not sure if we're really talking the global us or we're talking the United States us. And the reason I say that is because if you look at the descending levels of pollution, uh, the emitters, we're on top at about 25% of the world's pollution. And so China's coming next and there are other countries that have lower amounts of emissions that they need to clean up. And then there are deficit countries who actually need to be reimbursed or paid back or helped because they're dumping grounds. Can you talk about a little of that? Yeah. So uh, right now, about 30% of all emissions are coming out of China. Historically, that wasn't true, but that's true right now. 15% are coming from the United States. That gets us to 45%. And the 9% uh, are coming from the European Union countries. So that gets us to 54% of all emissions are China, US, European Union. So there's a couple of ways to think about that. 
Well, certainly in terms of today, that the, the heaviest burden of adjustment needs to fall on China, the US, and the European Union. But it's also the case that if you drop, if China, the US, and the European Union are go to zero tomorrow, uh, we would still have 50% of the emissions levels that we have right now, roughly speaking. So that it obviously has to be a global solution. And um, the low income countries obviously are not responsible for the climate crisis. Uh, they do, all, India, for example, India is not responsible. Uh, their emission levels per capita are extremely low. Um, but if India were allowed to grow on the basis of continuing to build coal plants and burn coal, um, we wouldn't never get to a zero emissions or anywhere close. So the, in my view, the rich countries, yes, have to subsidize the investments in clean energy infrastructure in the poor countries. And yeah, in the book with uh, Chomsky that you mentioned, I do talk about a, a financing program, uh, fairly simple, but it really uh, includes four components. Um, one is uh, to tax uh, uh, gasoline and other carbon, and then you generate revenue and you distribute the revenue to low income countries primarily. Two, you cut military spending. The US is the biggest source of military spending by far. So you cut military spending and you use that to finance the uh, adjustment in poor countries. Three, you eliminate fossil fuel subsidies. And that was debated at the conference last week and it's unbelievable that they're, uh, you're having a conference. Even John Kerry said, how can we even talk about continuing fossil fuel subsidies? So you have to eliminate fossil fuel subsidies. The problem with that is that a lot of the fossil fuel subsidies are ways to subsidize low income people. So uh, you have to come up with other ways to help low income people as opposed to fossil fuel subsidies. And then fourth, you know, last year during the COVID crisis, the Federal Reserve uh, injected about $4 trillion into Wall Street. Uh, they could do something at a similar, but a much smaller scale to invest in green bonds. Yes, in the United States, but not only in the United States, they could buy green bonds in poor countries. And that would be ways through which the, we developed this clean energy infrastructure uh, throughout the world. This actually, if I may, this comes back, uh, I think I understand the source of the question about whether I've ever owned a company that employs people. Uh, because somebody named uh, Stephen Fernandez raised this over email over the last week and said that uh, my company wasn't doing, I have a tiny company uh, that wasn't doing anything um, for um, people of color. Uh, I don't know how Stephen Fernandez knew this because I don't know Stephen Fernandez. I've never talked to him about my company, but just to tell you what the company actually has done, is doing, is that we've uh, basically been mainly involved in uh, doing solar installations in nonprofits, including churches, synagogues, including black churches. And uh, we are also exploring developing uh, solar in um, sub-Saharan Africa and rural areas. So uh, that's what this little company does in case somebody had this notion and implanted. I don't know where Stephen Fernandez got the idea, but uh, that's what the company does. So. In that sense, I have a very, uh, I'm on the ground in terms of this transition uh, at a very small level. I have one or two other questions. I'll make them quick. So um, I come from a selfish point of view. I plan on doing some new construction next year, probably my last bill. And I'm wondering what you think is going forth with uh, the United States of government offering better incentives to either build new construction with geothermal or wind or solar as compared to now 
they're, they're small now. I do think they'll increase. Yeah, so I couldn't exactly hear all every word you said, but I think I got the gist of it because it got a little garbled. But um, do I think there should be strong incentives to uh, use renewable energy, solar, geothermal, and in, in new construction? Was that the question? Right. Absolutely, yes. So, I mean, for example, in California, where I did a study uh, that came out in June, in California, um, basically they're uh, mandating solar panels on every new building. And that's the kind of thing we need. And remember, when you put the solar panels in the new buildings, you are going to save money over time. I mean, I myself have solar panels here at my house. And, um, you know, what? My, my energy bill over the year is zero because of the solar panels. And I, of course, I got the subsidies that are available, but they need to be more generous and easily accessible. My last question is, Exxon has the capacity because they're very large. Can you hear me? I can hear you, but it's kind of garbled. So that's the problem. I, I hear your voice beautifully. I can see you, but it's like, I can get like two out of three words. Exxon, I believe, can bring us into the future, even though they're a petroleum company. What do you think? Do I think Exxon can bring us into the future? In a positive that, way. No, I think Exxon needs to be out of business. Um, you know, I think that, I mean, Exxon as we know it, uh, is a fossil fuel company. And all, by all evidence, they, I mean, they're not stupid people. They spent 30 years, you know, trying to deny and to uh, propagandize against climate science. Um, and subsequent to that, they, they are obviously now recognizing uh, climate science, but they're, they're not transitioning their company. I mean, in principle, you could say, okay, we'll stop burning fossil fuels and we're gonna start installing solar energy, but they haven't done that. And I actually had a, a doctoral student who finished his dissertation just in the summer, who looked at why, why doesn't Exxon just look, see their handwriting on the wall and transition to clean energy? Well, because they can't generate the same degree of monopoly power that they have now in fossil fuels. I mean, if, yeah, as I was saying, if, if farmers in South Dakota can set up their own energy systems, that means that they could compete successfully with Exxon. So uh, yeah, Exxon, I think, is going to have to be phased out over time. Uh, they've made a lot of money, you know, and now they're going to just not be able to do that. And, you know, this is not the first time, this is not the only time in capitalism that companies that depend on a certain technology um, become redundant. And that's what's gonna to happen to them. Thank you. Thank you so much. I, we just have one more question for you, I believe. What, maybe two quick ones. Um, we'll make a quick idea over here. Yeah, over there, that's a good group. Well, mine was along the lines of your second to last question was, I know you've done, we've talked a lot about governments, but what can I do as an individual on my purchases or supporting companies that are working, are more green companies? Uh, we know that, you know, we're, uh, there's demand, that's where companies will focus their energy in. Um, uh, we all saw it during the pandemic, uh, smog clear over major cities. I know what you're saying is uh, to be true, but what can I do as an individual in, with my dollar to promote uh, uh, green energy? Well, uh, that's the thing. I, I think what you can do, what we all can do as people, basically is that's the only possible way that we get out of this. I mean, we just got through with the COP26 conference and politicians making all kinds of statements. Um, the only thing that's gonna actually force change is actions by people as individuals and as part of communities. So um, look, the, the, the single most important thing that needs to be done as I've been stressing is pretty simple. We need to stop burning fossil fuels. 
Uh, and so that therefore, um, if you are in, you know, in, in your workplace or any institutions you're associated with, um, as well as in your personal life, if you can uh, put up solar panels, if you can buy an electric vehicle, if you can depend, if you can use public transportation, all of these things are really important. If you're vocal about it, ever more important. I mean, the, you know, the people that have really raised consciousness about the climate crisis and what to do about it are teenagers, you know, starting with this woman, young woman in, in Sweden, Greta Thunberg. They're the ones that have pushed the politicians. Um, you know, so like the, the woman who's the head of the European Central Bank, who has a very powerful job. And she said, I have to do something because I can't otherwise look my grandchildren in the eye. Um, so we need to just kind of raise the moral focus, the consciousness about it and do things at like where I work at UMass. Um, we do, are planning to go off, you know, go 100% clean energy by 2030 or sooner. And that is the most critical thing. You know, I, there is this uh, divestment movement that has done good things in terms of churches, uh, in terms of uh, other institutions, colleges, universities, selling their stocks of ownership in Exxon and other corporations. And I, that is great in terms of like generating energy and, and support, but as an economist, <laughs> When I think about it, okay, if if UMass Amherst says I we divest, we want to get rid of all of our fossil fuel stocks, somebody is buying those stocks, and those somebodies are making money now because they are um, the hedge funds, the private equity firms are buying the stocks that the people are divesting from. The only way that this becomes these Exxon et al become less valuable is that people don't wanna buy oil. And so if you have an electric car, if you have solar panels, if you convince your, where you work to do that um, and you, you make a big deal out of it in your community and people, it starts sinking in that you can save money. Like I'm saving money right now because I have solar panels at my house, it's cheaper. It's, it's cheaper. Yes, you have to do the upfront investment, but then you save money. So that's, uh, I think there's so many areas in way which you can do that. And in that sense, I wanna commend Will and Tyler for organizing these sessions. Uh, it's the kind of thing we need in every library. And it's great that you guys have done it. And I'm very happy to be the first speaker. Thank you so much. I know that we only have the space for two more minutes, um, and there was two more questions. I'm not sure if that sounds possible, but would you like to just maybe pose it? Yes, for the I'll record. Just pose it. Um, I didn't hear you mention um, plastics in relation to the oil companies. Um, brief. I this has just been on my radar lately. If you could discuss the role of the um, oil companies uh, producing plastics and then and how that relates to um, the climate crisis. In terms so of yeah, uh, plastic production re relies on petroleum, petrochemicals. Um, and it has a lot of uh, negative environmental consequences, uh, including all the junk that gets dumped into oceans and so forth. And I actually have a great PhD student working on that right now. That said, uh, you don't burn fossil fuels in producing plastics and burning fossil fuels, not using the fossil fuels in the chemical processes for plastic, but burning the fossil fuels for energy is what generates the emissions. So uh, the plastics industry has a lot of negative uh, features. Uh, but one of them, luckily, is not, they do not contribute to uh, emissions. They, they do not. Okay. Because I thought that because plastic, a very low percentage of plastics can be recycled, even though we've been brainwashed to think that uh, they can. 
and I'm hearing my theory like 15%. Well, I think, you know, I'd love to have a whole different session on uh, plastics. <laughs> and my, my student is going to write a great dissertation. You should invite her the next time you do it. so much to everyone who is here. Big uh, round of applause for Professor Collin for taking the time. Thank you all for coming. And thank you again, Will and Tyler for organizing it. And good luck with the rest of the, the program. Thank you. This will be up on YouTube and we're really grateful for your participation. And, and okay, thank you. Have a good night. Thanks okay, bye.